Our call to worship is from Romans 15. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance taught in the scriptures and encouragement and the encouragement they provide, we might find hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Our hymn of praise is 392, All Earth is Hopeful, will be followed by the invocation by Connie McDaniel Hall. <laughs> Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for the opportunity for us to come together and to worship you, Lord. Be with each and every one of us that we go away with the message you would have us to have. And Lord, please be with those who are part of the service today. Bless him, Lord. Thank you, God, for this amazing day that you give us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Advent should admonish us to discover in each brother or sister that we greet, in each friend whose hand we shake, in each beggar who asks for bread, they are Christ. And whatever is done to them, Christ will take us as done to himself. This is what Advent is, Christ living among us. As we light the candle of hope, we pray. God of hope, awaken our hearts to you this Advent season and fill our hearts with hopeful anticipation of your coming. So when Jesus arrives, we are ready to receive him. And all of your children, in our hearts and minds, in his name, amen. says hope. Is this on? Here, you take this. I, <laughs> are you sure it isn't the one on the box? Deb is going to work her magic. Well, while I'm waiting for this, I would have the children come up and sit in this row. Are we there? Yeah, great. But Regan, I can use your help still. So Let's sit in the front row or on the floor, that's fine. Because I don't know if any of you were here the last time I tried this. It was uh, an interesting time. So I have a box and the box says. Oh, five times. I want hope, oh. hope, hope, hope. What does the box say? Hope. What does the box say? Hope. Oh, what does the box say? Hope. Oops, we, no, 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 we've got to get over here. Over here, Jackson. No, way over here, Landon, Jackson, all the way over here. Come on, come on, Landon. Come on, come on. Landon, Jackson. So today, it's all about what? Hope. Hope. Okay, you can go back to your seat because you got the idea. No, no, no. Sit down. I got something in the box. I want to know from Ryan, who could see this really well, what the two bunnies are doing. Uh, putting up a star? 
They're putting up a star on a tree. A tree. Very good. How many bunnies are there, Reese? Two. Two. Now, do you think that these bunnies are helping each other? Yeah, and you know what? Last week, Lori Say gave us sheets. Now, I forgot one thing up here, so hold on. I get so excited. I don't know if you saw this, but you want to take a couple of sheets and pass it that way. And Reagan, pass those. I don't know if you were here last week, but this is a Christmas Advent of giving because we all hoping for Christmas to give us gifts, right? So we're all hoping. Andrew, I think, can use one. And his sister. Great. So I want you to, if you can read, find which one says it. Oh, well, you'll have to go and share Reagan then, I guess. Yeah, go share with Reagan. Which one of these things that Lori provided, there are 24 things for you to do one a day to prepare for Christmas. And I love it. You guys are really working hard. Can you see which one might say anything about hope? The second one, let's have Andrew read the second one. The gift of hope, encourage someone today. Encourage someone today. So how can we encourage someone today? Yeah. Say like, you got this. You got this. And look at that. We've got kids sitting right here exactly where I wanted to. So you guys are wonderful. I'm going to encourage you to sit. Absolutely. So have you encouraged somebody today? Anybody encouraged anybody today? Hmm? Anybody out there? Did you get any encouragement? No. Well, let's think about how we can encourage somebody. Because this Christmas, instead of thinking about giving, getting gifts, we want to give a gift. There's another one on there that says about giving a hug. Would a hug be a, a gift of encouragement? A hug? Did anybody get a hug this morning? <laughs> Reagan got a hug this morning. Can we model a hug today? Landon, come give me a hug. Look at this. Ah, oh, he can check one off his list. Thank you. And we could we encourage Reese to give me a hug? Let's see if we can. We can do it, Reese. Yeah. Yay. See, it's so simple. We all we have to do is encourage people. For those of you who are reading, can you find one more that might say something about hope? One more. Oh, look at you guys go. Well, you're going to have to. Uh, oh, Keegan's going to share with you. Great job. Keegan did a gift of kindness. And if you look down there, there's kindness even. Wow. Two check marks off of your list for the 24 days of giving Christmas. Wow. Now last week, how many, were any of you here last week when Lori stirred it up? She actually had people coming up to the front and stirring up a cake. And they stirred and they stirred. And she said, there's a lot of fruits of the spirit, a few nuts. I was going to be here and raise my hand for that one, but I got sick instead, so I'm sorry. But you know what she did with that? She took it home. She poured it in a pan, and she made bread out of it. So what do you hope might be in this box? What? What do you think? The bread. You're absolutely right. The bread is in there, but I need some encouragement to share, because I think sharing is on this sheet too. Well, that's kind of demanding. I want encouragement. I want loving. Oh, loving is on there too somewhere. Loving encouragement. How can you lovingly? 
this. You got this. You're almost there. I'm almost there. I'm so close. Come on, encouragement. I can do it. Can I do it? With God's help and your help? I can do that. <gasps> but look, there's stars. The bread turned into stars. Oh, no. Do you know that when I was a little girl, there was this thing we'd go out in the summertime, and if we'd see a shooting star in the sky at night, we'd wish on it. So I think that these stars are a symbol of hope because I'm hoping they don't land on me because they're burning fires coming down, but I always wish, because a wish is a hope. It's a, oh, look at that. Landon, can you pick those up and spread? Can you give those to other people? Yeah, go ahead. Because everybody is a star. You gave me so much encouragement. Just take and pass them. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Oh, the giant ones. If you want a giant one. But you know what? There's a lot of people out there in the congregation might want a giant one too. I have a few extra. Okay. But you know what? We hoped and wished so much that the bread came back. It's just a tiny little piece of bread and it's just a taste of bread, but it signifies it represents our hope because, oh, would you two girls like to pass them out? Okay. Would you take the box and pass one to each? Thank you. Oh, they're acting out in kindness and kindness is one of those words. Here we go. Where? You can take your hope, star of hope home. When Lori made this bread, I thought, oh, this isn't going to, this is interesting. I don't know if I can get all that stirred up. It's just, we don't make bread in church. But you know what? For communion, we certainly do. Now, this bread has fruit in it, and you may not like it. So I would wait until you go home to take a taste. But remember that you are a star. And with a star, we can keep our hopes high. Okay? These sheets are for you. I bet if you go back, you'll check off. Yes, thank you. You'll check off half a dozen of them, the things that you've already done, including that number two of encouragement. Keegan. Because you use these stars as a shooting star analogy, can we throw them in the air like they're a shooting star? Not until the end of the service. Okay. Yes, you may go with your sheet of 24 things to do before the end of, uh, before Christmas countdown and your stars because your stars and your taste of the stirred it up bread. And thank you very much. I am encouraged by how many children that we have and how quietly they sat and how lovingly they encouraged me to open the box of hope. Good morning. One thing that Chris was really, really, really hoping for is that the communion tablecloth wouldn't get pulled off this week. And it was. And she encouraged the children to move towards her. And it did work. And we're so thankful. <laughs> My hope is in Jesus Christ. My hope is in life after death. So many things that we hope for, but those are the basic ones that I live my life by, knowing that Jesus Christ was alive. He was God with us. And this morning, as we share about hope, we're going to start with some scriptures. 
that have been an ongoing theme the last few weeks. And I was not able to be here the last two weeks. So I'm not sure what was shared with you in the sermons, because one of our hopes right now is that we get our mic system and the recording and the Zoom and everything up working well, uh, so that even if people aren't here, they can share in the services and uh, we can even watch them later when we are convenient for us to do that. But three of the things or four of the things that uh, came to me as I was getting ready for this sermon and other sermons were inform, instruct, inspire, and share. And our Roman scripture today will go through all of that. But I wanted to start by backing up and talking a little bit about the, the Old Testament scriptures of Isaiah that have prepared us up to this point. Isaiah was a prophet in Judah, and the king of Judah had the leaders from Israel and from Damascus come and say, we'd like to get some instruction. We'd like to have the king of Judah join with us in a war against Syria. We know war is coming, and we want you to instruct us. We want you to share your wisdom with us and, and help us to, to decide what we're going to do. And as Isaiah was sharing with the king of Judah, after being asked, what's your wisdom on this? It's going to be a war. He said, in the end, God will step in, in the future tense, and he will bring all people together. He will instruct them. He will arbitrate for them. He will have his justice come into the world and all peoples will come to God. He will be the authority over all other authorities and all people will come to him for instruction. All people will come to him for justice and it will come to a point where there will be no need for war anymore amongst God's people. All people will be God's people. They will even take their swords and their spears and turn them into pruning hooks and plowshares. And they will grow food rather than make war. I don't know if the king of Judah thought that was helpful at the time. He, he's trying to decide if he's going to align with Israel and Damascus against Syria. And Isaiah is saying, it's all going to work out in the end. God will have his way with mankind. His justice will be seen as the justice they need in their own lands. His instruction will be what they desire for their people. And they will all come under that umbrella of God's children. So... Isaiah also said in 9-2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. This is hundreds of years before Jesus, and yet he's saying that light will come into the world that will take care of the darkness, drive the darkness out. And we interpret that as talking about Jesus Christ being born and living and teaching and healing and instructing. So Isaiah is tuned in to the future. He's looking at the reality of his day. There's going to be a war. And people are asking him, give us some wisdom, some insight. And he's going right by the war that's coming. 
and saying, God's in all of it. God's powerful enough that we need to be able to look to the future, even in our bad realities of the day, even today when there's war between Russia and Ukraine, we need to know that there's another reality out there that's going to happen that is even happening today. And we have the ability today to be part of creating that reality. If we have hope in Jesus Christ, that will help us look at the world through a different lens. Today in America, we have four or five different TV channels that we can look to to find out what's happening in our world. And they all have a different flavor on what that reality is. And we need God to help instruct us in having the hope to see a new reality, a reality maybe not given by any of those TV stations about what God's reality is for our lives. We need to be a little more like Isaiah in not trying to figure out who we're going to align ourselves with for war, but maybe align ourselves with God instead. And what's God's will in this? And how can we live out that reality? Not the one that's being shown us on a TV channel or a radio channel. I wanted to share something that uh, our president shared on a blog. He was asked the question, how our concept of Zion might be informed by the movie trilogy, The Matrix. Looking at a different reality. Perhaps made more relevant each passing day by the virtual reality many of us are living in. And we don't see ourselves as living in a virtual reality where we've got these goggles on and we're seeing something that isn't really there and, and reacting to it. But our TV picture is like putting on these goggles. It's showing us something that it wants us to be part of and to feel like we're part of that's away from us. This is the answer that President Vesey gave. There are a lot of voices, influences, and powers at work in the world who have caused humanity to believe that our current reality is the only way to live together and to be together. This very nature of the concept of Zion or the reign of God is one of hopeful proclamation. What we're currently experiencing is not reality. Neither is it God's will. What we're experiencing is more of an illusion. Even though we're very used to it, what God has placed before us as a vision of possibility is the real reality. So there is a process of awakening and becoming aware and then tuning our lives towards the vision of God's reign. Now, here's the key. Once we awaken to God's vision and have the courage to begin to embrace it, we start living as if that reality was in place. We live as if what will be already is. And that's the way people of faith and followers of Christ live in the world. And that's why it may seem at times that we're not in sync with what's going on around us. God's reality. And how do we bring that reality into a world with so many other voices, so many other pictures of what reality is? If we take a look at our scripture in Romans today, 
we'll see where Paul was trying to paint a new reality, invite people into a new reality. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude and mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. If we look at the way Jesus reacted to people, the way Jesus cared for people, the way Jesus knew people, that's a challenge. He's not just saying, it's okay that I'm with you in the room. You don't bother me, I don't bother you. We can maybe carry on a conversation, but I really don't care to get any closer as a relationship with you. He's saying, build those relationships, get to know each other, care about each other, be Jesus to each other, so that with one mind and one voice, you might glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, that's how I want you to glorify God. That's how God will appreciate you worshiping him. And that's what Paul was praying. That was his prayer. He says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other. That's a prayer so that with one mind and one voice, you might glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and he says, accept one another. Then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God, he's explaining what his prayer meant. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made but to the patriarchs might be, be confirmed. He's saying Jesus Christ was the proof that everything in the scriptures up to this point, all of those promises were true. And Christ was one of those promises, that light shining into the world, into the darkness was true. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Now he brings the Gentiles into it. And he quotes from scripture, repeats the scripture that he has learned. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again, it says, rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. He's bringing the people together. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the people extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. Paul sees the need to bring the Jews and the Gentiles together. He's been telling them there's no rich, no poor, no Jew, no Gentile. We're all called to be one people. Break down the walls. Break down the divisions between each of you. And he ends with a prayer again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. All of you together, all of you having the same hope in Jesus Christ, living under Jesus and his instructions, his teachings, a hope that you can live together in peace, in harmony. I remember when I first started attending this denomination, I was told about God coming and giving the authority to Joseph Smith 
and passed on to the whole church and that we were established as the only ones with the authority of God to be priests on the earth because all of it had been lost previous to Joseph Smith turning to God and getting that authority. And I was raised Catholic. And I knew that if you talk to the Catholics, they would tell you the lineage of every Pope from Peter on. There was no break in the lineage, the authority of the church, the Catholic church. And I thought, hmm, God giving authority. That's true. And I like the fact that God wanted to call a church into being, to follow his ways and to be his people. And I thought, that's exactly what he did with the Jewish people. He said, I need a people that will come to me, will worship me as their God, and will live rightly under me as their God. God continues to do that, to call people to be his people. Paul is saying, yes, God called the Jews, but he wants to call other people too. And he wants us to learn how to do that for the world, for every people. When Debbie was in this church before I knew her, her grandparents came to a service that happened to be a communion service like we have today. Her grandparents wanted to receive communion, but they were not served communion because our understanding at that time was that we were a special people. And unless you were baptized and confirmed a member you were not part of that special people yet. And the communion was reserved for people that had been called and given the authority to bless it and then give it to people that had recognized him and accepted baptism in his special church. I am so thankful that God spoke to us through the leadership of our church and said, I accept all people that have given their lives to me. And our church said, we don't have to baptize people that have already been baptized. They were old enough to know what they were doing. They received a call from God and they said, yes, and they can receive communion with us. That is such a blessing that we're opening up in those ways. And I'm reading that there are people saying, why would we require someone to be baptized after eight years old to receive our communion? What about those people that were baptized as a Catholic, as infants, but were confirmed and knew what they were doing when they were confirmed receiving Christ into their life, receiving the Holy Spirit into their lives. And that discussion will continue. We're being called to look at life through the lens of hope. Hope in Jesus Christ, hope in a God of all people, a God of love for all people, and being called to make our hope live to cause us to live differently, to live open to God's calling, open to God's wisdom, open to God's taking us to new levels of acceptance and love for each other so that there aren't Gentiles and Jews or Catholics and Protestants and Baptists and, and Muslims and and. Hindu and all of those other religions that we see as walls and barriers to us, to where we can come together and worship God on his holy mountain 
Let him be the authority above all authorities and be his people, just his people, just his children. Not try to figure out what our lineage is, what our past was, but Jesus Christ is our hope. Jesus Christ is our future. And God has it planned out through all of our wars, through all of our divisions, through all of the realities that are they're thrown at us. Our reality needs to be, we can bring people together. We can love each other through our differences. We can be God's people as one people, one creation, believing in a, a love that goes beyond all of the hate, all of the depression, all of the differences. I want to be able to hope in a people that take all of that stuff in the world and put it into our composter of love that will break it down, will turn it into fertile soil for God's work in the world. Can we do that together? Can our hope be strong enough that we can't be swayed by all of the things that call us away from God's work in this world? For everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, clean water and bread. A shelter, a space, a safe place for growing. For everyone born, a star overhead. And God will delight when we are creators of justice.
you know. Where are the rest of you now? <laughs> well, we are going to have the communion. And you have the slide that says the invitation. Do you have your papers with you? Do I have some cures? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Read fast. Read fast. Okay. All are welcome at this table, just as the song said. The Lord's Supper or communion is a sacrament that we remember the life, death, and resurrection and the continuing presence of Jesus Christ in our souls. In Community of Christ, we also experience communion as an opportunity to renew our baptismal covenant and to be formed as disciples who live Christ's mission. Others may have differing opinions, added understandings within their own faith traditions, but we invite all who participate in the Lord's Supper to do so in the love and peace of Jesus Christ. Will you bow facing the altar as I read the combined prayer for the bread and the wine. Eternal God, we ask you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and this wine to the souls of all who receive them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and the blood of your son. And witness to you, O God, that they are willing to take upon them the name of your son and always remember him and keep the commandments which he has given them, that they may also always have his spirit to be with them. Amen.
During this time of disciples' generous response, we focus on aligning our heart with God's heart. <clears throat> our offerings are more than meeting budgets or funding mission. We can tangibly express our gratitude to God through our offerings, who is the giver of all. We've talked about hope today. It comes in many ways. For some, it comes in a prayer for others around us because we happen to be blessed at that particular or this particular moment with financial peace and health. For others, hope comes from looking for the next meal or paying the heating bill to stay warm, or being able to pay possibly for some medicine that is needed. You and I can bring hope to others through oblation. On the first Sunday of each month, all loose change given during the disciples' generous response goes to oblation giving hope throughout our community to those in need. As we share our mission ties, either by placing money in the plates or through e-tithing, use this time to thank God for the many gifts received in life. Our hearts grow aligned with God's <clears throat> when we gratefully receive and faithfully respond by living Christ's mission and sharing our blessings to those who are downtrodden at this very moment. Will those receiving the gifts come forward? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that uh, those here on that, may they be willing to give and give in a manner that uh, is blessed and a blessing to those that receive it. There are missions out that do require financial support, but there are those in our community that also are needful of gifts and help as they go about their lives. We, pr we pray, Lord, that those that are giving, may they also be blessed as in the receiver being blessed. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Breathe. Breathe on us, O oh God. Breathe your Holy Spirit on your people in all nations. Flame into us your breath of peace within our souls. Stir within us your love of compassion. Rock us with gentleness of understanding for faces known and unknown. Call us forth with renewed vigor for peace. New insights of your world where we capture your vision of peace for all nations. Advent is here, O oh God. We wait in hope. We wait. We wait to sense again the spirit of hope in the birth of the Christ child. The hope that shines brightly for all people. The hope that offers peace to restless hearts. The hope that stills our weary minds. The hope that comes wrapped in love. The hope that offers joy overflowing. God, our hope lies in you the lover of our soul. Amen. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.